Before I introduce this week's returning guest, I want to give you a bit of a background on this episode and how it's been a long time coming. A long time listeners will be aware that I've been endlessly fascinated by how and why, I suppose you could say, the online right gets Gnosticism so wrong. And I mean, I guess the loudest one from a popularity perspective would, of course, be Jordan Peterson. And last year, almost a year ago, so in June of last year, we were driving back from the top of Tasmania back to the farm, and I was listening to Jordan Peterson talk to James Lindsay about this exact topic. And I kept having to pull over and make notes on my phone because I had found it. <laughs> I had found where the error had crept into their thinking that would make them believe that, let's say, the Gnostics were the bad guys. And I thought, oh, this would be simple. I'll just cut the bits out of the, the podcast that I want and, and, and throw this together and, and it will be fine. But then I went traveling again. And honestly, the other thing that kept happening was um, uh, the world kept getting more awful. And so there were things, because what I want to do with this episode is keep the conversation above the belt, keep the conversation at the level of ideas. And that's all well and good, except uh, what kept happening in the world. Uh, I mean, this is middle of last year, so Jordan Peterson mentions Dylan Mulvaney at one point. But then, of course, we had his reaction. And indeed, recently, the last couple of days, the Daily Wire, when it comes to what's going on in Gaza. Uh, and, and so... Every time I'd get ready <laughs> to do this episode, something would happen where I'd just go, ah, oh, I just can't. And uh, fast forward to, I suppose, about a month ago, and finishing up the, the prayer course for the members, there's a section in there about Lucifer and prayer and the grimoires and so on. And I idly, uh, I idly mentioned that I will do a separate member video unpacking these ideas because I knew I had this episode in the back of my head. And I sat down to do it, and I'm like, you know what? It's still not right. It, it, it shouldn't just be me responding to this video in a certain way. I thought, why the hell should I do it? Uh, when, in fact, I can get a, a, a much better versed voice <laughs> when it comes to, uh, to Gnosticism to assist me. And that, without very much more ado, is how I introduce our returning guest, the one and only, needs no introduction, although that was rather a lengthy one, Miguel Connor. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, having me on. Always fun. Yeah, and I actually think this one will be fun because you you and I are kind of aware of there are and I've written them down. There's there's some claims that are made in the Jordan Peterson camp, the James Lindsay Jordan Peterson camp in this uh, situation. And for people who are listening to this rather than watching, we will have we'll include the audio of the original Daily Wire Jordan Peterson podcast, so you don't need to watch this. It's literally a talking head. A discussion you're not missing any um fun special effects any sandworms anything like that it's fine uh the claims are postmodernism is marxism that's claim one and claim two is marxism is gnosticism and there's the first claim is not 100 percent incorrect the second claim is pretty close to 100 percent incorrect and in this episode in particular between Jordan and James Lindsay, they talk about, oh, when critics say we don't understand these texts, well, we have actually read them. We went back and read Marx and we went, and they do mention hypostasis of the archons and, and all this stuff. So they've read them, which just actually piqued my curiosity more, which is, okay, so you've read them. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. How have you got this? Well, the nice way of saying this is, how is your interpretation at such wide variance from mine? But the, the correct way of saying it is, your interpretation is wrong and you've read the texts. So, I mean, you had a look at these videos and, that I shared with you from the episode, and then you went and looked at the James Lindsay stuff. Like, what are your thoughts on their, on their core claims? Do you, would you add or change anything to the postmodernism is Marxism and Marxism is Gnosticism? Is there another piece to their... Um, take that I'm missing? Well, I think there's a lot to unpack, especially when you look at uh, James Lindsay. Uh, but a lot of it is just a complete fallacy, I would say. I'd say the Marx thing, I'd give it a 99%. We can have a conversation later using the works of John Vervaki or Arthur Vers Luis about 
neo-gnosticism or gnostic elements if you want that's a valid conversation but as far as the text uh, the problem even if they've read the text especially lindsay he is very open that he's getting this from eric voglin who's the yes. 20th century thinker who he's the one who made the connection that everything is gnostic nazism communism anything that's any totalitarian movement is gnostic and he was pre nag hammadi library so he never got the nuances and overt ideas of Gnosticism and Hermeticism. We got to include both. Uh, so therefore, he completely mischaracterized Gnosticism, and Lindsay is still seeing through the lenses of Vogler, and he openly says it in his lectures. I would say that the biggest one, or the main one is the idea that Gnosticism was ever utopian. It was never utopian. There's nothing in the text about some social utopia or some social political let's make a better world. There's nothing in the early uh, history of Gnosticism on this or, or even medieval Gnosticism. So that fallacy is huge and the whole thing breaks down, Gordon. We, I could do a mic drop and you and I could have more fun talking about the the reboot of firefly or dune and we could walk away right now their argument falls apart right there i, I couldn't agree more it's if the gnostics are anything they're exotopian uh, and and i got like i first started down this um no this first piqued my curiosity as a little side quest years ago listening to dr joseph farrell rather than uh, jordan peterson here because he would say uh let's say the woke or whatever, are, are Gnostic because they play language games. So um, changing the difference, like ch changing up man and woman and, and, and um, biological categories and other categories. He would say, that's Gnostic, that's Gnostic, that's Gnostic. And I'd say, it's not, it's Gnostic in the sense that you're describing the bad guys inside Gnosticism. So that's the bit that I've, I find fascinating is like, that's Gnostic. It's like, no, there's a Gnostic read to what you were saying, which is inside a broadly speaking, and leave us, I mean, I'm talking to Miguel, you understand this, leaving aside the, the um, complexity of, of what like the single Gnostic cathedral is, um, where it's the so-called bad guys inside a Gnostic frame that are the ones that are trying to generate a utopia that like all utopias in literacy in, in literary fiction in, in expression, it's like a crypto dystopia. And so these guys are doing the same thing. It's like, oh, the Gnostics have all this, like they want to control things and, and, and tell everyone what things mean. I'm like, no, that's the bad guys, <laughs> the bad guys in the system. So the, like the nicest thing I can say is there is a Gnostic read to their qualms with, again, call it woke, but that doesn't make it Gnostic. Does, are you following? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. They're doing exactly what the enemies of Gnostic, they're doing what the enemies of Gnosticism did. They're inverting everything up and down. So, uh, I mean, the problem here is, let's, let's take a step back. Gordon, let's talk about, as you and I have talked, Gnosticism is intrinsic shamanistic. It probably came some from ancient shaman idea. And it, it involved the trickster. As it evolved, and we got into, like Bart Ehrman called, the Gnostic Age. It's just a term he used where suddenly it wasn't the shaman, the priest, the king, or the prophet who had access to the divine suddenly the common man had access to the divine and Gnosticism in Egypt became a very, in Hermeticism, a very personal religion. It was never about the collective. And this religion was available to all. It wasn't an elite thing. Again, you read uh, Marcus the Magician, Book of You, and women are allowed, uh, servants are allowed. Everybody can get this information, which, you know, Lindsay says it's that secret information. Vogelin also talked about it, but that information is available to all, and it's the transformative information. And then there's the accusation that, well, then they just wanted to escape the world, which is a huge fallacy, because, yes, you see... Um, groups like Heaven's Gate and other, which again, we can talk is not Gnosticism, it's a form of neo-Gnosticism. Gnosticism, like shamanism, is about going out into the spirit world, dealing with the spirits, they call them archons or aeons, being transformed, coming back with this information, 
and to those who wanted this information to heal the tribe or share with the tribe to improve those in the tribe that need the help of the shaman of this Gnostic. The, as some have said, the Gnostics were very much Christian bodhisattvas or it's altruistic. You go to, yes, to become one with God, the mystic experience, but you come back with this magic to heal people, to heal the world. Gnosticism is very much about trauma healing and uh, beyond the idea of, uh, yes, uh, the Gnostics believe like, uh, you know, uh, like proto Gabor Matis that your thinking affected your body. Yes, if you heal your mind, the archons that are all over your body will heal. But there's, t as, uh, as uh, Dylan Burns, a scholar said, there's tons of spells in the Sethians and they tell you how to yeah. do this with the scroll and use this substance to heal. So it is very much about healing others. And uh, yeah, really uh, transformational. Again, not social political and that's i think um that's uh that's a problem too you have with lindsay because and others Vogelin and others they talk about well gnosticism is parasitic it's like no again yes and no because for example april de Connick calls them a metaphysic orientation but since they're shamanistic they are a spiritual modality in other words Shamanism doesn't stand on its own. You're not going to find a church of shamanism. Well, maybe in America, but it doesn't exist, right? Shamanism always exists within the, within the cultural and religious context of the region, just like Gnosticism it does. Therefore, you have, you know, Kabbalists, Sufis, uh, Sethians, uh, Persian Gnostics, and so forth. So it is not parasitic. It is just an extra dimension to the religious world that is out there and that is the Gnostic religion. So in that way, Lindsay gets it wrong about being parasitic. And again, there was no taking over. It's not utopian. It's not political. It is simply the healing modality of a tribe or a society. Once again, the parasites in that system are the bad guys. Like if you're <laughs> looking for parasites inside Gnosticism, it's the fucking archons. This is, this is, very easy. Anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to jump across to the first video now because I want to track through some of the thinking and, and, and um, highlight where I think the, how the errors um, have, have developed because they're very telling. And I want to do that almost in a steel man way because towards the end of um, an episode that was on the one hand frustrating, uh, but on the other hand somewhat insightful, particularly when speaking of the trickster, when it comes to uh, the trickster and, and the, the, the being that they think, as do I, and this is kind of where I, we, we bring it back together, the being that they think is behind so much atrocity. Uh, so I'm gonna show, um, for people, uh, I'm just, well, we'll just jump in now. I'm just gonna show the first video and, uh, and we'll come back and have a discussion about it. What is woke and what does it mean for Europe? And so I tried to give, a, in a sense, a genealogy of woke. And actually, a taxonomy is more accurate. I started off by saying, well, I think that woke is, in fact, Marxism that's evolved to attack the West. Mm -hmm. And the techniques it's using are reminiscent of Mao's cultural revolution. And so you can say that it's Marxist or Maoist. But then I said, we can't understand that unless we understand Marxism in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. If we focus on his economic analysis and capital, we miss the entire picture. If we take a step back and say that he outlined an entire theory of man and the world and our behavior in it and the meaning of life and purpose, uh, telos for, for our, our being, which is to transform the world into the socialist utopia, to advance history to its intended end, then you can see that the particular mode of analysis becomes fungible. If it's economic analysis yeah, for yeah. Marx, then you get classical Marxism. If it's race analysis for the critical race theorists, it's almost, you have to massage around the edges, but right. the, it's almost the exact same architecture. Yeah, well, that's certainly what it seemed to me to be. You know, one of the things that's been disturbing, I suppose, on the gaslighting front is whenever I draw a relationship between postmodernism and neo-Marxism, first of all, people say two things that I don't know what I'm talking about, which, by the way, is rarely the case. <laughs> and second, that you know that's that's a conspiratorial misreading of the relationship that there's nothing to, that most postmodernism has nothing to do with marxism and you know i've taken that criticism seriously because it happens a lot i think well you know 
is there some manner in which I have this wrong? And then I go back as much as I can to the source documents, including Foucault and I think, and Derrida, and I think, well, they said they were Marxists. That seems like, you know, proof. And uh, the entire intellectual milieu at that time in France was Marxist, in, including people who should have known better, like Jean-Paul Sartre. So it's like that was the that was the water in which which those particular fish swam. And the postmodernists, when they themselves say that their what would you say, that their intellectual effort is tending in the Marxist direction or is an extension of Marxism, I'm pretty much inclined to believe them. And so I don't understand how this notion that those two, two concepts are separate has come about. Do you, do you have any, any idea about that? I do. I've thought <clears throat> tremendously on this question, and I believe I have an answer. And kind of like yourself, if I open my mouth, usually I've thought about something before I, I spout off. And in this case, it's the nature of the way these theories evolve. They evolve through what technically is called dialectical critique. And so each descendant theory, say if we use Marxism as, as, as the common ancestor, if you and that's what I did, by the way, in the EU, as I said, it's think of Marxism as a genus. And right. then you have all these species. Well, yeah. postmodernism is a species, but they evolve through dialectical critique. So for each new derivative that comes out, say postmodernism, they have to create themselves by giving a critique of the thing that they were before. So they start by saying, here's where Marxism is wrong. Mm -hmm. And academics hyper-focus on these distinctions, and they say, look, I see. They so said, that's what you think they say, is. just like you say, well, they say that they're Marxists, that looks like proof. They say, well, they said, we're criticizing Marx. So that's proof that they're different. And the neo-Marxists are no exception. And you'll find I literal see. So Marxists So you think it's today. narcissism of small differences, to I use do. the Freudian term. I do. Yeah, so there's a level of analysis at which these, I think your genus and species uh, metaphor is a good one. So there's a, there's a level of analysis at which these are all variations on a theme. And there's another level of analysis where the, well, no, they're distinctly different, which is exactly what does happen in academic micro-arguments. Right. So you think part of that's, well, I think part of it's just the attempt to sow confusion as well. Oh, probably, you know, and yes. So, or, and then also ignorance on the part of the critics, because they just don't know enough about what they're talking about to even know that there's a relationship between postmodernism and neo-Marxism and, and Marxism. I guess the other issue, too, is that in principle, the postmodernists were skeptical of meta-narratives, mm -hmm. and it does seem not unreasonable to point out that Marxism is a grand meta-narrative. Yeah. So if you're skeptical about meta-narratives, you know, you might start out by being skeptical about Marxism. And if you just focused on the postmodern critique of meta-narrative, then you'd say, well, it couldn't be allied with Marxism because Marxism is a meta-narrative. But my response to that would be, what makes you think that incoherence ever bothered a postmodernist? So I want to start there because... Uh, I, well, actually, the the superstition um, uh, behind the idea that I, like ideas are evolving to attack the West and, and something else, which I'm going to link up below for people listening in the show notes. There's a fantastic video by, I forget his name, He's, he has a philosophy YouTube, talking about Jordan Peterson and shadow projection. When it comes to the so-called postmodernists, here's how you can tell you're in a situation of shadow projection. When you come in at an 11 out of 10, for a situation that warrants a four out of 10, you want to pause and go, wait a minute, why have I come in screaming at something really like, what, what is that? And, um, and he truly believes that there is a multi-generational conspiracy of academics that are um, trying to destroy the West using um, the subversion of fixed categories via postmodernism. Now that's shadow projection. That's, that's a, a definite 11 out of 10. Is there a case to be made that they were talking, um, Sartre and Derrida especially, I actually do not, I will go to bat that Foucault was not a Marxist, at least towards the end of his life. Um, but the other two talking out of both sides of their mouth, yes, uh, absolutely. And so there's a four out of 10 in what he's saying, but this idea that they're deliberately sowing confusion and, and deliberately causing incoherence, like, ha 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 ha, attack, attack. <laughs> That's an 11 out of 10. That's shadow production. We were talking earlier before we hit record. If we just could sit down with Dr. Peterson and talk about uh, Jung's influences, his 
um, shadow-based response to the Gnostics would potentially melt away because famously, uh, Jung is very inspired by and transformed by Gnostic thought. And Jordan Peterson thinks he's, this is mean, but I'm going with it, some kind of Jungian Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, again, we're going into the idea of uh, Vogelin's idea of Imanez, I can't pronounce it, Imanezatizing the Eschaton, that uh, if we hate our lives here, you know, they give the example of, uh, you know, the, the angry college professor who's never getting his dues or the factory worker, that if we can't get, uh, if, we, uh, if this is hell, then we're going to bring heaven down here, which again is... 1,000% against the Gnostics. There's nothing in the Gnostic text. Maybe the Cainites with their spell to bring down the cosmic womb. But even then, it's... Uh, so this is the idea that it's silly. And it just cracks me up. I would say that, yes, I think there is Marxism as the genus. I would say that we're de wokeism is probably closer to Maoism or Stalinism. Sure. I laugh today because people are showing clips from a three-body problem from the because it shows the Chinese revolution it's like they're finally getting it it's like you need a show to tell you that what Mao did is very much what wokeism has done today so uh, I think that's a, the rest of it yeah so I, I actually have written on my notes the genus and subspecies thing is actually good um, mm -hmm. I just think that Marxism is a subspecies like I'm kind of setting up the pieces and 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 um, subphyla underneath that certainly do include postmodernism and uh, and and Maoism, as you say, and, and woke or whatever that is, for sure. Uh, but I think one of the reasons. So here's the thing: the 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 kind of thinking that breaks stuff into genus and subspecies is itself the genus. Like mm -hmm. it's it's the materialist positivism. This is why they can look at the stuff they don't like in the modern world in the downstream from the enlightenment world and go aha that's marx's children it, uh, but these things the good things about the enlightenment they aren't and we must protect them so no 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 you're, you're still dealing with a materialist positivist mechanist universe that was to borrow dr peterson's metaphor um the water in which marx swam so they can't see it because they're swimming in the same water, which I actually find hilarious because I'm pretty sure James L Jordan Peterson definitely is Christian, but I'm pretty sure James Lindsay is as well, or something like that. So it's he's like an atheist these days. Yeah. Oh, is he? Okay, fair. I know yeah, he was new atheist. He mentions that oh, he regrets okay. he regrets the time that he spent running with the new atheist crowd ten years ago. As well, you should because they're yeah. demented. Pedophiles. Speaking of but, uh, like, another yeah. branch of Marxism, new exactly. <laughs> But I think the thing I want to uh, get from this first video is um, you get the shadow projection here. And I want to convey that idea that if, it's, it's for people listening as well. If you're coming in at 11 out of 10 at a situation that if you just take a breath and go, that should have been a 4 out of 10 response. I should look into why, I'm, uh, why, it's, uh, why I think Western civilization is being destroyed by a, a, um, a multi-generational cabal of academics. Um, there's a four out of ten in there for sure, <laughs> but there's not there's not an eleven out of ten. And the thing about the genus and subspecies is that is a useful way of um, demonstrating how ideas can overlap and 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 the currents that can feed into them. Because uh, what we're dealing with, you're quite right, is is closer to Maoism, especially as there's some there's, I hate. I hate how it always comes to like. There's some good stuff in Marxism too, because there is. There's like there's class analysis, which I refuse. No, to No, no, you're about. right. You yourself yeah. once said very wisely, uh, Marx got the problem right, but the solution was wrong. Definitely. But nobody has gotten the right solution yet, and it is, this is class warfare. He's a. I think we would agree. He's a hundred percent right. But again, nobody's figured out what to do. No, Everybody's exactly. pissed off. <laughs> All right, cool. So that that's the. That's the opening video that I wanted to, to table and, and orient for people, and we will uh, we'll jump on into the next one now. Away from the scientific and into the kind of blatantly mystical and, and romantic, which the postmodernists are wholly characterized by, 
you can just imagine it. It's a cat without a tail. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. see if we do this, you know, I said Marxism is economic and critical race theory is race. And we yeah, can say that yeah. queer theory is the concept of who defines what's normal. Postmodernism is really a Marxist analysis of who gets to say what things mean. Yeah. Who gets yeah. to well, define things? Well, it seems to me the fundamental core around which these concepts circulate is... Well, one core is resentment and bitterness. There's yes. an envy. There's no doubt about that on the motivational front. Yes. But the other core, more ideological and intellectual, would be the notion that every social interaction is best viewed through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. And so then you can do that with economics, which is essentially what Marx did. But once you've established that pattern, well, it's all about victimization and power. So that I think, I think it's actually the same claim that... that it's, it's like a neo-Christian claim that emerged out of the Middle Ages because there was a doctrine in the Middle Ages among some strands of Christian thinkers that the, that the secular world, the, the earthly world, let's say, was the domain of Satan himself, right? Mm -hmm. It was ruled by the prince of power. And I think that's exactly what the Marxists claim, except they're, you know, are they in favor of that or against it? It's very difficult to say. But their fundamental claim is something like all human relationships can be understood understood through the lens of power and oppression. I mean, that's Foucault in a nutshell, right? Yeah, because yeah. his whole theory is that everything is carceral power. Every time yeah. I say that word, I have to stop and tell you. It means prison. Yeah. I mean, incarcerated is the is the derivative for, yeah. for people. But um, it's all about carceral power. So these, these sects that you're referring to in the Middle Ages of, of kind of bizarre Christianity were actually Gnostic heresies that were developing. And I yeah. think that actually by means of, of Hegel coming down through Marx, who inverted yeah. it. Yeah. I believe we actually actually are looking at a Gnostic heresy yeah, that I got so hidden yeah. inside of economics yeah. and social. In fact, if we read Phenomenology of Spirit from Hegel, 1807 is a publication, you get distinctly the sense that what he means by spirit is what he says he means by spirit. It's a spirit of society. Mm -hmm. It's a social phenomenon. It's kind of the the seed of, uh, of sociology in a sense. And this social spiritual realm is, for, for Hegel quite literally, because he was a heretical theologian, is the, the working of the Holy Spirit in the world. It's not this, you know, transcendent uh, third person of the Godhead. It is this, this is the functioning of human beings in the collective all and how that's moving through history. And so if we relocate as a modern transformation of kind of this heretical Christian Middle Age, Middle Ages, you know, almost New Age movement of the time, you know, mystical movement of the time, we have a very clear shift from the transcendental to the social, to the social universe representing the spirit. And so then Marx, he actually figures out the code. He says, no, Hegel's got it upside down. We focus on the idea, and the state will follow, and the spirit will follow the state. And he said, no, no, no. And then the, the spirit will, will sublate and raise to a higher, Alfhaben in German, and raise to a higher level, and we'll have a new idea, and blah, blah, blah. That's his, his trinity cycle, his dialectical cycle for Hegel. Well, Marx says, no, it's upside down. We start on the ground. We do the work. We do the praxis. Do the work is the modern phrasing. We do the praxis. We do the activism. And we change society directly. And then that will cause, as society changes, the what he called the inversion of praxis, the, the social conditioning to rain down on people and actually reify the transformation of society. So this, I think, is where Marx had inverted Hegel, and this is where we have a shift from the pre-modern transcendental spiritual to the modern social spiritual. And this just becomes the playground of romantics and eventually the postmodernists who throw up their hands and say this whole thing. He almost had it, Jordan, especially when he rolls his eyes. You, you can see he, so he has it right there. I, well, <laughs> I was driving through the, the Lakes District of Tasmania, and I'm like, there's nowhere to pull over. And I'm like, I'm repeating it to myself. Pause, pause on the, on the podcast going. <laughs> like, he, he gets so close to what we said at the beginning, where he's like, uh, and it's true. Like, let, let's just go with the medieval. Let's, it's mostly true. Let's go with there is a medieval heresy where... Uh, inspired by Gnosticism, where the all of physical reality, he's kind of talking about Catharism, but it's, it's, a, mm. um, it's a glass half empty view of uh, Catharism. Right. But that, that physical reality that is the domain of the devil. The devil is set by God itself to be the lord of this realm. 
Um, and then he's so close. He's like, oh, but wait, are the Marxists in favor of that? Or are they not? And that, <laughs> and he said, oh, doesn't matter. I'll go off talking about power and Foucault again. I'm like, no, 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 Dr. Peterson, stay with that thought. Stay right there because I tell you who isn't in favor of that. Like that, it's, yeah. it's, he's so close to getting like, oh, in fact, the it's the Marxists who are the demented utopianists and the Gnostics aren't. If you just stayed right there, right there. And that was the bit. This is where this is the whole reason <laughs> for this episode is I had to like I found that one and and I, you talk now actually and then I'll because I also found um, when I say Lindsay's error he has way more of them than Jordan Peterson but there's an, a particularly egregious and like unfootnoted one here that is where like no I'll just tell you now like he's so was Hegel influenced by the Gnostics kind of. You can make that case in a f philosophy class, sure. But then he goes, and then Marx inverted Hegel, and they're Gnostics. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So if he inverted the Gnostic, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> like, that, but like, also, where's the, how did he do that? Oh, he inverted, like, if you're talking about the spirits moving through society, yes, sure. Um, sure. He, he, he reversed the sequence. But... There's, there's, you, there's your hole, right? Like, if you, you can make the philosophical case that um, Gnosticism informed Hegelian thinking. What people don't understand, if you're listening to this, in the 19th century, everyone was downstream from Hegel. Hegel was it in philosophy. So the idea that there's some yeah. kind of secret... Cons if you are writing philosophy or economics in the 19th century, you are wrestling with Hegel. Okay, so the idea that there's some kind of, like, secret lineage... Uh, moving from the Gnostics to Hegel down to Marx is absurd and unfootnoted. And I am bringing it up to say, um, James Lindsay, that's where your error, that's where you, that is the break, or that is how I break your idiotic continuity, somehow going back to the first few centuries of um, the common era with the Gnostics and tying it all the way to, I don't know, purple haired blob people on TikTok. Like, that's that's <laughs> terrible, okay? And and this it was in in this one little exchange. I'm literally I'm driving through the London Lakes area um, in Tasmania. <laughs> oh, oh my God! I thought because it's Peterson's first. I'm like, oh, I found his error. And then oh, I found Lindsay's error. Somebody where? It, like I'm going through. If you've never you've never driven in Tasmania, but the the roads are kind of goat tracks. And I'm like, there's nowhere to pull over <laughs> and make my notes. <laughs> what do I do? So uh, it's, that's lived rent free in my head, but I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You found the yeah the the error in the Death Star of both of their systems. Glad you didn't get in a wreck. No, agreed. Uh, and of course, we have to understand uh, how religion works. Again, we're going to genus and stuff. Hegel is, of course, an idealist, so he falls into the mind model. Of course, Gnosticism and Hermeticism and Neoplatonism are mind model religions. So, of course, there's a Venn diagram, just like. Of course, Gnosticism has strong existentialist vibes. Just so, therefore, it overlaps with the with Sartre and all those and Heidegger. Of course, but it doesn't mean they're Gnostic. But again, it's a it's more it's more nuanced, and there is no sort of you know uh, lineage. I maybe a lineage here. But the thing that I wanted to address as well, Gordon, is uh, they're talking about resentment and anger and all that. You know, again, they mentioned, you know, the angry professor who's, you know, wants to, he's not getting the dues he wants, so he's going to join the Marxist movement, blah, blah, blah. And then you and I had our conversation with Matthias Desmet, and he talks about how mass formation starts with anxiety, dissatisfaction, and suddenly everybody's, the 60% start joining together in this movement because everybody's pissed off. There's no future, and that's how you get totalitarian regimes. But then they talk, he talks, may, uh, other people have talked, you know, Vogelin too, that the Gnostics are angry that they were pissed off, and this and that, which I think is an error, because again, if you read the texts, the texts are extremely joyous and happy. These people have found something great, they are full of love and compassion and gratitude. Yes, they see the world for what it is, a prison, a lot. But there's no resentment towards the archons. You have the magic spells. A shaman isn't mad at the spirits that might destroy him because that's his job. He's happy. He's armed with the, 
with the spells and the words and all. So there's a extreme sense of joy in these texts that you should be able to see them. And then there's the example, I call it the Chris Knowles example because he has called out Lindsay on this. But he goes, if you want to know what Gnosticism would be today, if you want an unbroken or almost unbroken lineage of Gnostics, guess what? We have it. Ever heard of the Mendeans and the UCD? Are they trying to take over the world or being resentful or anything? No, they're good people. Pacifist, intelligent, magical. And then you look at Gnosticism throughout history, whether, again, he's talking about the Cathars. Cathars were, were productive members of society. They were beloved. They were kind. They were not angry. Same with the Manichaeans. Same with the classical Gnostics. Plotinus is having you know, conversations with them. They're having arguments and they're disagreeing. But the Sethians were not like blue-haired people throwing chairs at Plotinus at the college. No. They're very happy, productive, uh, educated, and uh, yeah, happy people. So there you have to take away this idea that uh, resentment is part of Gnosticism, which is not. No, it's not, it's not part of the, the practicing Gnostics praxis, dare I use a dangerous word. But again, like, I can, is uh, academic resentment, uh, resentment a serious issue? A hundred percent, right? Because there are, and, and this is one of the reasons the videos are sequenced this way, because Jordan Peterson goes on to make a couple of very good points about the spirit of Lucifer. Uh, and, and so that's, this is why this video has been such a struggle for me to make, because I wanted it to be a critique of James and uh, Dr. Peterson's ideas, but I also needed it to be an exploration of archetypes using Lucifer as the example and all this, and it was a mess. So this is, this is working uh, much better for me. But again, like, they they are actually pointing at i think a um a legitimate phenomenon within academia but it's still not gnostic so much as there is a gnostic frame on it and a kind of specifically david ikean version of gnosticism like a valentino sethian space gnosticism right where the right. archons are jealous of our creative capacities that they're actually jealous of um, how life functions, and so that's why they seek to uh, trap and control it. So there is, it, one, like, every time I hear them talk about, oh, it's the, the resentment and blah, 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 it's like, guy, you'd actually make pretty good Gnostics. Um, if, <laughs> if you could just get like the basic ideas right, you'd make pretty good Gnostics, because it's not that the stuff they're talking about isn't there, it's just it's not it's not in Gnosticism, it's, it's in reality, and, and the Gnostics have a frame or an expression for it. What do you think? No, I agree 100%. And that's, again, that's a problem that both modern neo-Gnosticism and their critics get wrong. Gnosticism is an experiential religion. And when you do the altered states of mind, you and I have done ayahuasca, we do meditation, we have visit the spirit world, how could we be resentful with this universe? Yes, it's horrible universe, very dangerous, but it's wonderful to be awake. It's wonderful to make contact with higher worlds. There's nothing like it. All you can feel is joy and compassion for the universe. So they forget maybe they need to do ayahuasca. So maybe they'll get the text. You know, the text will read to them as the plant will tell them what's up. You could argue, I'm just thinking about this right now, that... Um... We mentioned Jung earlier, and that would be the way to to um, get Dr. Peterson, at least, to see Gnosticism in a, uh, a more loving light, perhaps. But the thing is, Jung was once asked what we could do to prevent nuclear war, and he said, more of us have to integrate our shadow. Like, that's how mm -hmm. we prevent nuclear war. The, the telos, like, to use Jungian speak... The telos of Gnosticism is individuation. That's actually what you do in response to the hell realm that we're in. Uh, and, right. and that's the opposite of is it resentment and all the rest of it. That's not, the Gnostics aren't doing that. Dr. Peterson, the Gnostics are individuating, and that is their response to the world. And that's literally what you, after you tell them to tidy their room, what you tell people to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go within. That's what you exactly. would say. Go within. That's simple. Sit down, yeah. shut up, sit down, and breathe. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm really enjoying this because it's it's allowing me to uh, 
to express loving frustration, like uh, not loving, um, uh, amused frustration at this because it's like, ah, oh, they're so close. <laughs> well, Dr. Peterson's so close. I don't know how much uh, help there is for um, Mr. Lindsay on in in fixing this. He's got he's got his shtick down pat. Yeah, uh, his income depends on being you know yeah. circling the wagons around Vogelin and. All right. So the so, next. Yeah. No, about. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about? I had some thoughts on Jung and Peterson, or we can. Yeah, go for it. Let's do it now because this is actually <coughs> a really good uh, moment because the videos start to move in the direction of exploring Lucifer. So we're kind of finished with the mm. postmodernism is Marxism chunk, and then we're going to move into Lucifer and archetype. So this is a really good time to do that. Lay it on us. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think the thing with that's what cracks me up uh, is. <laughs> Peterson is very influenced by Jung and he does a great job at expressing Jung. Bravo to him. And he's helped out many men who are lost or not being initiated in this world because they, they stole initiation from us. And, you know, but uh, the, I, that's where, and it drives me crazy because I understand that the secular Jung world does not want to admit about Gnosticism or even religion. I mean, you you can watch, uh, you know, this Jungian life for a year, and they're not, those three cats aren't going to mention Gnosticism, even though it is one hundred percent true that Jung was deeply influenced by Gnosticism. I mean, his ideas are so important, and I would tell your readers to get uh, C. G. Jung in the Tradition of Gnosis by Alfred Rabbi Rebe or Douglas Stewart, The Apocalypse of the Reluctant God, or the work of Lance Owens, or even Becca Tarnas, it will show you that there is, there's no way around it. And Jung himself, he, uh, he began to study Gnosticism while doing research for his book, Transformations and Symbols of the Libido. Libido. And he read some, some stuff in Abraxas in 1913 and all that. Then he was having in his, his experiences. He uh, went back to, he was having his liver nuvus experiences. He, then he went to work for the army to help patients during the war. And it hit him like, oh my God, my visions really are close to Gnosticism. Like Philip K. Dick having his visions and going, oh my God, I got to go revisit because they're exactly the same. Jung had the same thing. He said, oh my God, what I'm learning is exactly what the Gnostics have said. And we know he did say that he finally found his long lost friends with the Gnostics because they had the secrets of the soul, the psyche, which Peterson is trying to unlock. Uh, we know that he almost broke international law by getting trying to steal the gospel of truth and having a copy while they're doing it. I mean, we know without a doubt, Jung and Gnosticism go hand in hand. Later on, of course, he started using alchemical uh, symbols because they were richer. But again, alchemy comes from the place where the Hermetists and the Gnostics were chilling out, you know, upper Egypt were chilling out at their Starbucks. So you have, it's, I mean, you can't get around to it if you want to be intellectually, not intellectually, uh, honest. Um, uh, and that brings me to talking about Alexandria. What drives me crazy too, Gordon, is that Lindsay will, will quote Ben Shapiro which tells you, you know, how, de how how our society is just falling apart if you have to quote Ben Shapiro for an intellectual. Ben Shapiro always goes, the greatest thing, or the greatest thing about Western society is that we are Jerusalem and Athens. And I'm like, oh my God. And then Lindsay says, yes, we're great because we excluded Alexandria. And I'm like, well, that's a bunch of shit. Ale I mean, you can't be, you can't just, Anybody who studies know how important Alexandria is. And in fact, it was Tertullian who said, what do I care about Athens? All I care about is Jerusalem because orthodoxy was removing that was removing Athens and it was at the Alexandria vibe that was making it survive. And in fact, Carl Schmidt, that's the guy who really influenced uh, Goebbels and the, and, and the other Nazis. He himself said, we need to be modern day Tertullians and destroy the Gnostics around us. In other words, like you said, totalitarianism and what's on the other side, Gordon? Gnosticism. I mean, Alexandria is so important. And Lindsay goes on his, on his 
talks and he starts bashing Hermeticis. And I'm like, what would Egypt be without Hermes? What would Plato, he talks, he extols Plato and Pythagoras, but what would they be without Hermes and Thoth? What would the Muslim caliphates be without the wisdom of Thoth and Hermes? The Renaissance needed Hermes, which expanded our mind, which gave us the Enlightenment period, the American Revolution. Hermes was there as much as Moses, Jesus, or Plato. I mean, again, Hermes, Hermeticism, the Gnostics, when they go through history, they make a better society. So don't give me this, all we need is Athens and Jerusalem. We need, Ale more than ever, we need Alexandria. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the Septuagint was compiled into Greek in Alexandria. Like the Bible yeah. comes from Alexandria. It's it's the, Good point. Just, the it's inbred um, stupidity at um, Ben Shapiro levels, I suppose. <laughs> That's it just I don't know. It's it's that the um, it's the Michael Bluth line um, from Arrested Development where he opens the paper bag that says "dead pigeon" inside, and there's a dead pigeon inside. And I don't know what I expected. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is good because uh, the other part that, and, uh, how to say this right, I'm glad we're talking about Jung and archetypes and so on now, because the second half of the episode, and this is, re everyone has to take their mind back to say um, June of last year, because he's about to mention Dylan Mulvaney and all that, that's what was going on. And um, for me, this was the second part that made me realize I wanted to do a um, episode on this, but it was a bit of a mutant episode because I've been waiting a year to do an exploration of, which I mentioned in last week's live stream, like the jester archetype as a f as not quite the trickster, but if we're gonna use genus and subspecies, it's, it's somewhere in there. Uh, because it occurred to me in February of last year that the most powerful people on earth uh, were, well, the most pivotal people on earth in February, 2022 were both comedians in the form of Zelensky and in the form of um, Joe Rogan. The potato in chief was um, arguing with uh, Joe Rogan, uh, who ended up being correct about the injections and so on. And you have the high heel wearing um, lunatic uh, being bribed to destroy his country so NATO can start its war with Russia. And if you want to throw in the mix like Jimmy Dore, Dave Chappelle, like in, oh, in the quote unquote culture war world, it was a real time for jesters like uh, not so much comedians, but people who can hold that electrifying energy of outrage. Because uh, that's difficult. Like to, the, the jester is a risky job because you basically have to make fun of the king and kings can cut heads off. So you actually have to have, um, a, a spine's the wrong word, you have to be able to contain a lot of the world's energy that, that throws itself at you. And, uh, and I don't, I'm not, funny enough, I mean, Dave Chappelle is a genius, and I think Jimmy Dore is really, really funny. Yeah. I have no opinion on Zelensky's uh, comedy, but from what I've seen, it isn't good. Joe Rogan is, and this is relevant as we move through. He, I say this with all love. I don't think he's funny. I know he thinks he's a comedian, and that's like the core of his identity, and he's got his club in Austin. But I don't think he's funny. I have seen his stand-up. He might mm -hmm. be, and obviously he's a, like, I mean, he's a podcaster, I'm a podcaster, who's more popular? It's very difficult to say. But um, so I'm not, I'm not coming at him as a person. I'm not coming at him as a podcaster. I'm just saying I don't think he's funny. And that's the weird bit about this archetype. It's like, anyway, th th this is all relevant as, as we start to move into Lucifer and the evil one, I suppose, because here's where I think we find other points of consent between, let's say, Miguel, our Cosmovisions, and at least uh, Jordan's, at least Dr. Peterson's. But the words are different. But it's like, no, I get, I get the, the being you're talking about is very real, sir. It's just yeah. you think it belongs to us. <laughs> and then, yeah, that, that's uh, it's no bueno. So we're gonna, unless there's something you wanted to add there before we jump in. No, 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 that's good. Again, yeah, I don't think Rogan's funny stand up. I, I, I haven't seen Zelensky. I would like to see him and take him on his own talent, but I've not I had a chance. Obviously, yeah, but... Chappelle and Dor are just, they, they, they both kill me. They're great. Yeah, they're amazing. Uh, I would 
I would not be sane without Jimmy Dore. Like, uh, God bless him for the, the high volume of yeah. high quality content. And his yeah. sidekick, the ball guy and the Jewish guy, they're also amazing. God, they yeah, make yeah. me laugh so much. Yeah, I don't yeah. know their names, but I can't wait to hear them when yeah. I watch them. <laughs> All right. Well, so we're going to jump into this video and, and respond as per usual. So what is power in this analysis? It's the power to compel, to, to compel, extort, right, to, right. to, extort, yeah, to yeah. force behaviors, to yeah, 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 paraphrase absolutely. Larry Fink. And so... Right, no kidding. Yeah. To paraphrase Larry Fink and, and his bloody black rock. If we, again, if we take this Gnostic concept seriously, the Gnostics believe that there is an all-good, transcendent God behind everything that's so good that he's completely pure spirit, completely uncorruptible. And therefore, anything material must not be of that. It must be, in fact, evil. And so where did it come from? And they've got a mythology for it, but it doesn't matter. This create this character called the Demiurge comes into being uh, through a series of kind of cosmic accidents in the Pleroma, as they call this. And the Demiurge, Demiurge comes from the Greek Demiurgos. Demiurgos means artisan or builder. He's the architect of the world. So he builds out the world, but in fact, he's a demon. And so he builds out the world as a prison. So God in Genesis, in, in Genesis 3, with the fruit, has imprisoned Adam and Eve in the garden. And the snake is saying, did you know? He just doesn't want you to know that you're like him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This same system, this is what Cain's rejecting. He's giving his second-rate sacrifices. He's not doing what he should. Mm -hmm. God's telling him if he does what he should, things will work out. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, this system's corrupt. Right, exactly. And that's so this exactly. is the same. Yeah, he pattern. calls God out on his misbehavior, essentially. That's which right. Is a, if you don't think that's the sin of pride, there's definitely something wrong with the way that you're thinking. Right. And so I think that this is ultimately the Gnostic motivation. So it must have been... I wonder if it's as surprising for you as it is for me that this is the rabbit hole that you've ended up going down. You know, I had no yeah, idea when I started investigating these theories that, you know, that the root consequence of that investigation would be to move down levels of analysis into the religious domain. So I did start to understand that as you move down levels of analysis, yeah. you inevitably end up in the religious domain because the religious domain is the deepest level of analysis. Right. So, but it, I mean, has it surprised you that that you're I'm sitting here talking about Gnosticism, for example, yes. while trying to diagnose the ills of the modern world? Yes, it, it has surprised me. It, it's very curious as well because I was this character. I had this. I mean, it cuts through every human heart, as Solzhenitsyn mm -hmm. very eloquently put. I was this character. I was a very frustrated academic, and I think it's typical. What is the most common, I mean, maybe there are others, but one of the more common psychiatric disorders that academics complain about is imposter syndrome, right? They, oh, I've got this degree, but if I'm actually stupid because the PhD earning process is quite difficult, and you're always surrounded by people who know far more than you do, who remind you of it on a daily basis. And so you end up with this massive amount of imposter syndrome. I'm not really you know, good at the thing. I'm not as good as they think I am, this kind of delusional complex. And rather than taking the certification and saying, you know, well, okay, I've earned this. And so you have this baseline where you, you like Marx, what do you do with your time? You dig into some area, you finally see the secret, you know, truth nobody else saw within that. And I'm just talking as an impulse. I'm not getting religious yet. And you see this, and then you write and you write and write and seven people read it. Nobody cares. And you start to think to yourself, why am I not getting career advancement? Why am I not getting the accolades? Why, why isn't society, or if you're Marx, why isn't everybody else just paying my bills? Don't they see how important my social theory that I'm writing is? So you're doing something that's, that's that not particularly useful. But it's right. Cain. This is a second. That's also Lucifer, by the way. It is. Right. You're making a second-rate sacrifice and expecting to get first-rate results. And that jealousy grows right there well yeah well that intellectual pride is a big part of that too you know i, I worked saw, so hard where's well, mine? well it's it's there's it's worse than that even it's not even that i worked so hard like i had clients for example now and then who had a luciferian problem and they were often very smart people mm -hmm. who hadn't put in the work that's certainly the case but they were very annoyed because it was clear to them that they were smart as or smarter than everyone else yes. and yet the world hadn't unfolded at their feet Yes. You know, and so they were very bitter and resentful about that. And like it's definitely the case that in Milton, like Lucifer, who's the bringer of light, is definitely an envious intellect, right? Yes. And he's the the, the angel who in God's heavenly hierarchy 
rose the highest and fell the furthest, and that's definitely that's something that is definitely something that can characterize intellect because the human intellect is a remarkable uh, spirit, you might say, capable sure. of the greatest good, but it is also the thing that can fall the farthest. And that wounded intellect is the most vicious of spirits. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of that combination of Cain and Lucifer. And yes. it's also, you know, it's also the case in the biblical corpus, if you take the stories apart, that the spirit that raises the Tower of Babel is the wounded spirit of Lucifer and Cain, right? And that's erecting a technological alternative to God, but partly in an attempt to worship intellect instead of well, instead of, well, instead of whatever God might be, the highest, it's something like the highest spirit of genuine self-sacrifice, right. something like that. Well, so, the fact is that the, the, the wounded intellect or the wounded narcissist doesn't humiliate itself in front of anything. There's Peterson so close. He is so there. And what, g the highest form of God is self-sacrifice? No, the highest form of God is the intellect. <laughs> Um, the news <laughs> it's so good like this is where so why i had this video going to be part of or, or in between the prayer course which we've just completed in the uh the next grimoires course which is coming up whenever this comes out next month something like that early may uh is i have this way of understanding archetypes where you you know you have an archetype when it is crystalline in its meaning when it can actually reflect to you that which you most need to respond to so um lucifer is that ecosystemically and ecosystemically in the cosmos because what he's saying there is fantastic it's like it's fantastic jungian thought uh it's really really good lucifer is the the spirit of the intellect like that the the wounded intellect and and in, there's a, sh uh, a youtube short which won't be in this video of him on stage talking about that archetype being the the vizier like jafar so the, lucifer was the highest of the angels and and the intellectual capacity of the humans is the one that we value the highest but and is also the most dangerous and also the one that's like uh most dangerous when it is wounded when it when it's angry and this is this is all true like lucifer as a being is, is a is a bigger idea than that but they're getting to like and even the cain it's so it's so frustrating right because like the cain and abel stuff where they're talking about almost like the um, the the psychological or the psychic in the sense of psyche significance of second rate sacrifices. That's all good and true. Like that's all really good. Let's just say esoteric Christianity. Like I like it. It's just, this is the why I want to do this video is like, Oh, I'm so frustrated because you guys just spent the first hour being wrong. <laughs> and then you got to come through with like, ah, oh, but that bit's good. But for me, the, the idea of Lucifer as, um, as, wounded intellect and and harboring resentment the the clients that he talks about we all know people who are that um malevolent in their resentment mm -hmm. and and where where the where the um the next few videos go builds that idea towards um the evil one and its its actions on earth but that same um why not me energy is there in like a yaldabaoth story like that's kind of the point it's like we're, we are talking about the same being uh, or we are we are using different words for the same like crystalline multi-dimensional archetype that reflects and interfaces with people as to where they are and what they most need to confront is probably better but like this is where i'm like ah oh, yeah i don't know like <laughs> dr peterson listen <laughs> so close <laughs> what do you think well, you would say, too, that uh, the problem here is that Lucifer or Satan is becoming as meaningless as God because there are different modes of Satan and they have different archetypes behind them. The trickster, the font of evil, the bright one. I mean, again, Jung's genius is that he never wrote down a BuzzFeed listicle of archetypes. He said he just kept mentioning and he said, you know, what I'm giving you is living. It's alive so my followers can discover other archetypes so we're talking about which lucifer will the what lucifer are you talking about like you said is it the lucifer that steals your cattle the folk spirit the trickster the uh, personification of resentment as you said the fallen angel 
enlightenment that's, reason. Yeah. So that's it gets confusing sometimes, and I, don't know I think that you should I couch think, it more into. I think you need into, a idea, ahead. right? Like I think you need this idea that it is you know an archetype because it is multidimensional. So Lucifer is all those things. It's it's expressed in the grimoires, and I said this in the previous grimoire course all those years ago. There there is a very very sophisticated theology that people miss in the grimoires where you have the what's called the infernal um, trinity or unholy trinity. So the, the three presiding spirits in the reconstituted spirit list, and then underneath that you have the four kings, and, and underneath them is the various list of spirits, is typically Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Satan. And then it becomes Astaroth later on in, in the story. But that's very theologically, uh, very, very theologically nuanced, almost like uh, anthroposophy because you have a way of containing at the top of, I don't know, the, um, the shadow kingdom, that kind of nuance. That the, the Lucifer, if, if, the, if the top of the shadow kingdom comes to you as Lucifer, it is a different experience to if it comes to you as Satan, which is far more of the, um, the, the malice and destruction and like very set in the sense of the Egyptian god, like howling desert wind destruction, hate mankind. So depending on which one you get, and, and Astaroth well, or Beelzebub, once again, so containing this idea of, the, of an infernal trinity is a way of what I'm saying, which is an archetype is, is crystalline and multidimensional almost by definition, and certainly like the big ones, quote unquote, in the cosmos that have to do the, the heavy lifting of being like Lucifer, has that crystalline yeah, like that crystalline response. This is what I actually think when they when they talk about like um, phosphorus light bringer uh, and so on. I, I experience it as light refracted inside an infinite crystal. Like it, it's 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 a, it's not like the bright light of um, high beams. It's um, it's the impossible to kind of get your mind around. Uh, and funnily enough, this is a Jordan Peterson meme, right? There are cathedrals everywhere for those with eyes to see because he took a picture of his Evian water bottle on a plane and the light was coming through and it had like, mm. it looked like stained glass windows on the side of the airplane. But there's something that, that's weird. I can use that that meme because that for me is the is the embodied experience in ceremony of the light bringer of like, oh, it's like, it's all around infinitely in this kind of jewel and, and that... There's almost like a David Bowie villain angle to it of like whatever I'm facing <laughs> is the thing and its job in the cosmos is to face that thing to me that I need to look at, right? So right. it's, um, yeah, he was getting like, well, th I think what they were talking about is good. I just don't think it's the, the whole story of Lucifer. And here we get back to Jordan Peterson's shadow projection, I think. Oh, indeed. And I think the other thing that uh, I kind of am disappointed, uh, especially with Jungians today, is the idea, yeah, you talk about shadow or the ego, both are complexes, but you don't hear a lot about complex theory, which Jung said was really the most important part. I know, it, you know, uh, synchronicity is sexier and archetypes is sexier. Complex, we have to do a lot of work. Like in your last show, Gordon, you mentioned complexes because you know it is essential, especially when you're trying to face these forces outside. You've got to understand which complex is taking over you. So you got the complex, you got the archetype, and it's hard. I mean, it's again, it's one of those things that most youngins don't want to touch, including Peterson. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, and certainly not in a uh, on like a one to many conversation level. But of course, there's there's complexes that capture you so that you don't see complexes, right? Because you can get, you you will get trapped in the um, the fun and simple excitement of ooh, that's a synchronicity. Ooh, the the <laughs> the um, the magician archetype. Ooh, like I'm this doing is all... shadow work. Woo. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, doing research for this and just in general, I'm sure it's the same for you with my life, my YouTube version of the for you feed on um, TikTok. Very occasionally will give me like. Um, I don't know any of them, but like self-help YouTubers talking, like 11 minute, 17 second video of how to do shadow work, complete guide. Mm. And I'm like, oh man. It's very popular in the new we age are, community. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are fucking some kids up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> shadow work in 11 minutes, 17 seconds? I will watch that at 1.25 speed and be done. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you can find it in two seconds. Whatever you post angrily on Twitter, you true. know it's your shadow. There's a That's like you true. said. There's a very high chance it's just shadow projection. So yeah. even when you know, I know uh, I'm glad, as you say, you have to be bigger than your complexes. When I see Lindsay and Jordan, they're mischaracterizing Gnosticism or your average Baptist priest. I just, I roll my eyes and I walk away. I just, but when you asked me, I was like, okay, this is a good opportunity to get sort of a, a cohesive, friendly, non-angry argument against what we feel they're doing what they're mischaracterizing and in some ways can be very dangerous for society. I would say so. It's, um, yeah. I, I, and in fact, that's a good tee up for the last couple of videos for when we get, and this is coming, it's coming back to Jung, when we get captured by the wrong complexes or the wrong archetypes on a societal level. So I'm just going to share that video now. And so I started to create a lexicon. I started oh, to create an encyclopedia oh, oh. of their terminology and I, just would focus on one term after another. Let me get into their head and know what they mean and go read primary sources. When they use the word democracy, where does this come? Oh my gosh, we're all the way back to Lenin. You know, Lenin do you, defined democracy. Do you, feel, do you feel that you're dealing with a they? Or do you, you know, there, there's, this, there's this biblical idea that what we war against is principalities. And I think of a principality, one variant of a principality is a system of ideas. Yeah. And I think, well, there's, there's no, in a way, there's no they. There's a, there's a system of ideas that's an animating, that's a set of animating principles. Sure. Right? And it partially inhabits a multitude of people. That yeah, that uh, is so yeah. good. But like, ah, oh, Jordan, just record scratch and go back to the beginning. But that is like, I mean, that is exactly what the powers and principalities line, I think, is talking about if you have a cosmology, which he kind of does, of expanded mind, however you want to do that, however you want to do that, idealism, animism, whatever, the the idea that um, the psyche isn't in us, we're in it. That's mm. what that line is referring to. And he's so, it's like, oh, that's exactly true. This powers and principalities thing. He's so close to, I hate, as do you as well, like um, overuse of militarized mind wars, but there is something about the uh, Gnostic, esoteric Christian, I don't know, um, telos outside of or incorporating individuation where you understand that and it's why you don't go well I'm not going to argue with James Lindsay because there'll just be 10 more James Lindsay's because that's not actually what I'm going into quote-unquote battle against and it's like ah oh, yeah mm. <laughs> thoughts <laughs> yeah and of course it's ironic because if you take your Sunday school lenses your programming Paul's cosmology is a 100% Gnostic. We are fallen yep. in this world. There's these archons. He uses our, they're spiritual beings who control the stars and fate. We are in this illusion, birth pangs of the universe, and this aeon cosmic Christ has to break the veil. So we see Yahweh, you know, he uses Yahweh as the transcendental God. And finally, the Jew and the Gentile will see Yahweh as he really is. So that's ironic, too, that they're playing. And of course, Paul believed in the whole Enochian <laughs> fallen angels thing, and it's funny. But then the language thing that they keep using, he said Farrell does, the Gnostics came from this sort of uh, rabbi tradition of puns and double meanings that was very popular in Judaism. It was form, it's like their form of koans, where you invert things and words have double meaning, and you're like, I wonder which one they'll get, and... You're, you're, you're having fun with words because words fail us. And it was just their, it was just their tradition. It wasn't anything nefarious of anything. It was something to jolt you and help you, you know, reach whatever spirituality you need based on what you know about these words. So I don't see anything wrong with this, what the Gnostics were doing. I did an episode with um, Danny Nemo last year about are there gods in the Bible? And it's about the fact that um, Hebrew uh, as a sacred language is designed to contain multiple meanings because it's it's supposed to be our best effort at containing the sacred as a way of engaging with. Uh. So of course, every time you come to a word or a text, it it should be infinitely it should be a font of infinite inspiration. It's just we have what they think with Gnostic wordplay is because we made a couple of um, idiotic philosophical errors a few centuries ago where we're like, nope. 
that word means that one thing. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> There's only material language. Uh, and it's that um, the UG theory of language, which is just completely incorrect, which is that language started simple. UG, you know, don't hit your head yeah. on the top of the cave and then and so on. That's the whole Owen Barfield thing. Like language has declined over the millennia rather than uh, complexified. So we're dealing with people who were who could run rings around us um, language wise today, because, as you say, that was the tradition. That's how you engage uh, with reality, with the sacred. It, it just conservatives. And I learned this from Jordan Peterson, of all people, um, on that personality um, grid trait thing that he's so enamored of are um, anxious when things aren't in fixed categories like things need to be like um, a woman's place is in the home and this is a blah like uh, conservatism is uh, well anxiety increases for conservative in the um, face of the uncertain whereas generally speaking more liberally inclined people are um, inspired by and enriched by the uncertain by the by the blending and so on right. which means they're just like never james Lindsay's always going to be freaked out by nuanced words because it is how he's built on a constitutional personality basis which in fact i learned from the guy sitting opposite him in those videos but you're absolutely right like the language <laughs> language is a sacred thing yeah I know. The funny thing is, if you if you give uh, a Peter's son James Joyce as Ulysses, he would be like, oh, double meanings and metaphors. You know, he would get it if he reads James Joyce. But if you go to Gnostic texts, other texts, he's a little hesitant. And uh, it is funny, too, about you said Orwin Barfield, because, yeah, 1984, what the party's doing is it's shrinking the dictionary until it gets to a certain number of words where you can control people with this double speak political correctness so interesting that we are actually Lindsay is actually kind of getting us to a totalitarian future by again taking things too literal <laughs> as they say and uh, and I, I understand i mean obviously the big knock that origin and plotinus had again that was their deconstructing of text although we can do that today with comic books everything gets deconstructed but if the gnostics do it it's bad because they were sacred texts. And Plotinus hated that the Gnostics had revelations and apocalypses. He just, he couldn't understand how somebody could do that. It was against the philosopher, but I'm like, sorry, revelation and apocalypse are fine. That's how we get through these things. Yeah, couldn't agree more. All right, let's jump to, let me make sure what video I'm at. Six, we'll move on to the next one. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I, I fundamentally reject the word theorist. Uh-huh. I don't think it's a theory. Huh. Uh, I think that they're they're open about their collaboration, and so yeah. Well, that's so interesting, eh? Because we have Antifa, right? And at the same time, we have actual fascism, and everything that Antifa attacks has nothing to do with the actual fascism. That's right. Yeah. So it's so there's another great cosmic joke for you. Yeah, the yeah. anti-fascists are supporting a gigantic conglomeration of governments and large banks yeah, and industry. Yeah, yeah, Is it, yeah. That Pharmaceutical all working companies and Pharmaceutical legacy companies. media. Isn't that yeah. fantastic? Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's really. The cosmic great. jokes are it's, are piling up. Yeah. Well, I've been posting pictures of evil clowns lately, and people yeah. think they're wondering what the hell I'm up to. You know, which form of insanity has now gripped me. It's like I realized that Satan is an evil clown, mm. right? I, I started to understand that, you know, yeah. when, when, I, when I encountered the sign that was over Auschwitz, because the sign that was over Auschwitz was Arbeck macht frei, yeah. which means work will make you free. Right. It's like I thought, that's a joke. Then I thought, who would tell a joke in Auschwitz? Himmler. Right. Well, well, yeah, but who's the who's the spirit behind Himmler, right? Who's yeah. the great cosmic joker? And then also uh, mutual assured destruction, right? The acronym for years was MAD. I thought, oh, that's a joke too. Yeah. Right? right? It's all yeah. these jokes, you know. Well, and then I watched the death of Stalin. Have you seen that? No. Oh, it's great. It's a movie about. I've heard. About, yeah. Oh, it's so great because it's it's as br it it portrays the brutal reality of the soviet union there are terrible murderous raping catastrophic things going on in the background of the movie non-stop and then there's these five jokers one of whom is stalin and the rest of his evil crew and they are like they're bumbling parodies right everything's a parody and i realized that after really thinking about that and thinking about that motif of the joker and the and the clown which has become so prevalent in modern culture i thought I see, see, when things become totalitarian, they turn into a parody, right? Like Dylan Mulvaney's a parody, 
and what's happening to women's sports is a parody. And what North Face is doing with their advertising is a parody. And it's like, oh, yes, that's right. Satan is an evil clown. Yeah, well, right. what did Marcuse yeah. write in 69? So I, he wrote in the Essay on Liberation that it's crucial that the resistance, meaning them, the radicals, take on the form. He said that the clownish forms that so irritate the establishment. It must become an antinomian revolution. <coughs> Right, everything upside down. Everything upside down. Everything. Upside everything down. becomes, and then so Judith Butler talks about the politics of parody. You get this kind of despair. We'll oh, never I didn't transform. know any of that. Had oh been yeah, actually laid the politics out of strategy. Of yeah, politics of parody, the clownish forms that the that irritate the establishment. I remember reading this because, of course, clown world is the meme on the internet. They call it. Yeah, clown yeah, world. yeah. And I'm reading Marcuse, and I, I stumble on this. Take on the clownish forms. It's like, oh my god, clown world world was a plan. Right. The only thing about the evil clowns is they're not funny. Damn. Right, that's the big they're well not because funny. no, they're not funny. They're not that's funny. right. They're not funny at all. It's not funny at all, right? And so, and and that's quite interesting too because one of the things you see about the totalitarian left is they really hate comedians. They right, hate. so they love parody, but they hate comedy. That's right. Right, right. And it's got to be it's got to be parody of the darkest form. Yeah, it's always dark or almost intentionally stupid or destructive. Yeah, yeah. Every time. What do you think, Miguel? Was Clown World a plan? <laughs> well, first I want to say I would definitely watch Death of Stalin. That movie also blew me away. It gives you a bird's eye view of uh, how absurd Marxism and Stalinism is. I mean, in so many ways. And it does it through humor, which works very well. Very dark parody. I mean, Steve Buscemi playing uh, Nikita Khrushchev while still being, you know, Steve Buscemi. Oh, what the fuck? Stalin's so mad at us. What are, you know, he, he's like a gangster, but uh, excellent movie that I would say. It's not very, there's like 40% that's not historical right, but you're going to get where we are. I would say um, we are in the age of the trickster. I think the, um, is the line in under, uh, under the Silver Lake that the coyotes rule the universe. And I think this is true. I think this archetype has taken over. And I think once you see things like Trump or crypto or the pandemic through the eyes of the trickster, everything starts making more sense. And it's a lot easier to navigate reality because who rules the transition of an empire or a new doorway yeah. or a new sure. civilization or a new world? The trickster has to carry you through. And it's not easy because the changer, Michael Greer has run, the changer is going to change you. And if you don't like it, you're going to be left behind in the dust. But we are changing civilization, collective psyche, history, and it's the time of the trickster. I'm glad you said that bit because the trickster as a word, kind of like coming back to Jung and people lacking synchronicity, but not complex. It's a term that... Um, has had its teeth removed and people think the trickster is like, oh, an unexpected thing happened to me today. It's like, no, no, no. Um, this is what I mean about, you know, you've got an archetype when it is multidimensional in its form because I, um, it is in biology, in ecosystems. So if you have damaged tissue, let's go to terrain theory, you will get a certain bacterial assembly that shows up to, uh, eat the dead flesh because you know, I actually just had a mouth ulcer and that's part of that process, right? Of like, okay, this is really painful. I say, oh, the, a part of that pain is the nerves and the other part of it is the bacterial assembly that is clearing the, the, um, the flesh away, right? Like the actual um, cells that need to be removed. That's what the trickster does to civilization. So all that stuff that actually some of, I'll come to the Dylan Mulvaney thing in a bit because I have this Dylan Mulvaney tech. No, I'm going to do it now. So, um, <laughs> I'm very disappointed in Dylan Mulvaney. After the Bud thing, she should have, and I've said this a few times, but she should have gone full Black Widow talking about, because he's kind of right, like she's not funny and she could have been. She could have gone full Black Widow and walked into the, the, um, the Fifth Avenue offices of Fortune 100 companies and just like pointed at them like, a, like an old witch, right? And right. that would have been really fun, like having just destroyed like whatever it was, 45% of Anheuser-Busch's uh, market cap. <laughs> she should have gone to Boeing and Raytheon and all the, maybe she did go to Boeing, but like Raytheon and all these companies and be like, you just watch yourself or I'll partnership with you. And that would have been fucking fantastic. <laughs> um, so I, I'm disappointed in Dylan Mulvaney. 
uh, because it's like the I, actresses did, for Madame Webb leaning into how disastrous yeah, it is. But it's actually like she, helping their career. It's helping. Well, their I mean, it, I mean, it did help her. Career, but the thing is, it's kind of like she is a parody, but it's not her fault. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, later on that year, she got given GQ London's Women of the Year, Woman of the Year, and it's like this is. This is the arrival of that. Whatever you're feeling about that is, it's the arrival of this wider trickster form. And it includes some of the things he said. The totalitarian mm. left doesn't like humor. Um, but I would say totalitarianism doesn't like humor. And I, I'm speaking of the pandemic, I'll say it, I don't care. Um, <laughs> the, if you'll recall, and obviously they had to be uh, wound back now, another Joe Rogan correct thing was to do with ivermectin and the CDC having those tweets of horses. I'm like, oh, you're not a horse. And like, do you mean hey, this, <laughs> this UN essential medicine? But like, it wasn't funny. When, and the same thing, the best ones, I don't, you wouldn't, may not have seen them, but the New Zealand government, um, under speaking of horses, under horse face, <laughs> um, contracted some former client agencies of mine from back in the day to do some like fun memes during their imprisonments for like, hey, this is like trying to do like a fun, wacky way of like never see your friends and family and let your old people die alone. And they were attempts at humor that were so bad they'd give you AIDS. Like it was just just so awful and so he's right again you you get their bias of like the totalitarian left doesn't like jokes like the left says the right can't meme the and left the right says the left meme. can't meme yeah. uh, but the thing is totalitarianism can't mean and it's whatever fucking flavor you want the other one can't do it you're both correct <laughs> but it's so important when we're talking about this and and the <clears throat> this comes back to lucifer beelzebub satan as a top of the grimoire um trinity that thing jordan peterson said about auschwitz is fantastic the um that is a joke that is a satanic joke in the sense of if you can to answer his question because obviously it was like well who would make a joke at auschwitz you let that open up inside you of like what being finds that funny and it's like, oh, shit, like, I, I might not have ever encountered that being, and hopefully you won't in your life, but like, oh, shit. Oh, that is it. Oh, I know. I get it now. I get what we're talking about. And the, like, the, this is coming back to this, why it's so difficult to describe, why I'm using multidimensional, multidimensionality as an indicator that you have one of the big archetypes like Trickster, because inside Trickster is evil clown and jester, and, and all of these forms. And it's here now for ecosystemic reasons, which is we are going through this transformation. Thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with you. And it's very hard because it's like the Mothman. You, the trickster has a morality we can't understand, can be as vicious as putting signs over Auschwitz, as kind as helping you discover your career. It is, yeah, fi it's kind of like yeah, fire from the gods, except who knows who's yes. handling it. So. It's yeah. uh, and it's hard again. Somebody like Lindsay will can't understand it. It's hard, so he's just gonna work on getting more clicks and followers. Somebody like Peterson, he you know he'll, he, I'm sure he struggled with it once he gets more into complexes and archetypes and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Someone can get to him and say like, the the actual Gnostic's goal was individuation in the Jungian sense, like just that one yeah. sentence. I think people would, I think. That would open it up for him, like, oh shit, like, no. A better way of saying that. You is... said it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, but a better way of saying that is that the Gnostics' response to the condition of our world was to individuate. Mm -hmm. That that was it. Like, and because that that's what Jung told everyone to do. <laughs> that we save the world by a um, individuation, by a, by you know, gospel of Thomasing, like that thing that's inside of you find it express it that's that's literally that's the game yeah because when you're individuated that's when you find out what your mission is in this world what your holy purpose how you can make a better world all that good stuff i mean that's that's really it that's the altruism that you find what did Jung say free will means doing exactly what you need to do right now and if you don't make the con you know paraphrasing if you don't make the unconscious conscious it will appear to you as fate. So, and the trickster is trying to break that through always. Yeah, the morality thing is really important because when you deal with spirits or beings that um, experience time differently to us, uh, it's one, yeah. um, it what what 
from our experience of time inside bodies that are erroneously um, recording it in a linear fashion, uh, it looks horrible what they're doing. And, and even, <laughs> wait till the end of the sentence before you get outraged. And, and so even something like the Holocaust looks horrible because uh, it is when you're in, in a human experience. But when you are a multidimensional being that is ecosystemic, like the bacteria in my mouth eating that flesh, like the, you're dealing with a, a cosmos that you can't understand. And it's like, well, why, what is the joke an indication that actually there is a deeper, terrifying medicine here somewhere? Like, do you know what I mean? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Miguel, that is the end of the videos to share. And we've checked off a few, I guess, important responses to the fairly unfortunately pervasive online right errors in uh, conceptualizing the Gnostics. Off the top of your head, are there any that we have missed that we uh, should probably discuss? There's a few, but I wanted to do a couple of important ones. Cool. Uh, again, I wrote notes. I could go this on all day because it, it's a fun exercise. Oh, it's fun. But, it's, th yeah. This is, ah, the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no resentment. We're not like screaming at society or anything, shaking our old people, yelling at them at the, at the clouds. But I think somebody I wanted to bring in is, of course, uh, of course, is uh, Yano Kuliano. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. was, of course, when it comes to A, uh, historical religion. I'm not as smart as Peterson or Lindsay, but Culliano, I can say, is 10 times smarter than those two put together. Oh, yeah. A genius and a practicing yes. magician. He used Hermeticism to increase his IQ like that. Mm -hmm. But he also understood totalitarian regimes. In fact, he was killed, murdered by Romanian say. secret police because of his view. So he understands Marxism, totalitarian, he understands western esoterica he himself studied the gnostics because he was hearing voglin and he said no there is no way that marxism and gnosticism are compatible and he wrote about it he did say okay i'll give you emmanuel kant i'll give you emmanuel he, he thought gnosticism <laughs> but marx no no way so i would bring in yano culiano as you want to say appeal to authority? Fine, because the guy was just a genius. It's like arguing with Margaret Barker about Christianity. You know you're you're gonna lose. <laughs> so, the other thing too is again, if you want to make an argument like John Vervaki at Toronto or Arthur vs. Luis vs. Luz here in Michigan, that there were these neo gnostic movements, but. These movements are devoid of the transcendental quality. They're void, uh, devoid of the altruism. They're, they, they've injected a utopian thing. In other words, these movements, Valentinus and Simon Magus would be like, oh, what happened? And you can say, okay, maybe Marxism, maybe Nazism. You could say Scientology, Heaven's Gate, David Icke, uh, Course in Miracles, although, you know, if you want to make that these are neo-gnostics, that the right wing and their idea of archons is neo-gnostic, then fine, we can have that conversation. But saying that this was some, that the classical gnostics were plotting Marxism or whatever, no, no, you, you just can't. You've lost it. And here's an interesting thing I wanted to talk about is, like, here's an example, Gordon. You look at Charles Manson. And he's talking about Abraxas and we got to transcend dualities and do what we want. And there's no reality. And you're like, damn, he sounds really Gnostic. And you go, well, why does he sound Gnostic? Well, because at the time in the 60s, Herman Hesse was really big in Southern California. The Beach Boys, uh, all these groups, Steppenwolf, obviously were influenced by Herman Hesse. And of course, Herman Hesse talks about Abraxas. So but it's removed, it's, started, it's dilated. You go, well, where did Herman Hesse learn about Abraxas and Gnosticism? Oh, Herman Hesse was a patient of Jung and knew about the seven sermons of the dead, all that, so, but it's different. And then you go, well, when did Jung learn about it? Well, Jung got it all the way back from Basilides in Alexandria in the second century in Abraxas. So then you go, okay, this Charles Manson Gnosticism and Basilides Gnosticism are way apart. But is Charles Manson a Gnostic? The answer is, of course, 
yes and no. Would that be the right answer? It's like <laughs> things change, they evolve, and that's where we are. It's like the Catholic Church today is nothing like Christians in the first century. Your average rabbi is nothing like a, a Jew in first century BCE. Things evolve, and that's where you have the conversation. This, you mentioned Manson's a good example, right? So one of the things in the previous video that I didn't pick up on that I want to is um, this idea that, and this is true, this is the jester, that um, the clowns exist to somehow um, change or impact the establishment. And they say that as if that's bad. Uh, and, and the example I used in the first version of this, which was going to just be recorded for members, was, okay, well, we're talking about Lucifer. So the Vatican, speaking of the Catholic Church, is a criminal bank run for and by pedophiles. So if that's the establishment, and I'm in opposition to it, but like so would Lindsay and Peterson in that case. Like it is demonstrably a criminal bank that covers up like worldwide pedophilia. So if you oppose that, quite literally opposing satanically, Lucifer, like you're the good guy. Like this is this is what happens when you, you're with an archetype. The archetype doesn't carry a morality; it carries a charge or a polarity, and exactly. and the situation that you're in. Um, you encounter that archetype in the situation and find where you are in relation to other stuff. Because uh, on the other side of it, speaking of uh, people who've been killed by uh, totalitarian socialist regimes, during the Cold War, I would have very much been more on, especially in Eastern Europe, on the Catholic side, where they're there, like, killing one bishop a month who's just trying to, like, get food to people who've had their lives uh, destroyed. Yeah, yeah. And you think, well, no, hang on. And in that case, the bishop is Lucifer. The bishop is Lucifer um, resisting the establishment or the state, which in that case is the USSR. So mm -hmm. the, the Manson thing is a really good example. A archetype is not moral. It has a charge or a polarity. And it's fascinating to see conservatives uh, get upset about the idea of a clown right. archetype or a jester when, like, Dr. Peterson literally just recommended a film that does exactly what he was angry about which is um, parodying the establishment. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. No, that's really well said. And if, if somebody cornered me and said, well, what polit politics the Gnostics had, I would say they were probably anarchist socialists. Emma Goldman, that's who they were. That's mm. as close as I would, if I had to say, but again, it's, it's Gnosticism is a, apolitical. Absolutely. Well, sir, um, my, my device has decided probably cause it's so effing hot in, uh, <laughs> in this little apartment in Paraguay right now, but my, uh, my devices have decided that, uh, we're done. I think <laughs> hey, the, the trickster <laughs> gave us, uh, yeah, stuff. the trickster gave us an hour and 40 minutes. What else do you want, Gordon? That's true. <laughs> That's very true. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for this, uh, this cathartic uh, experience of, um, of, of exploring something that I know has been a source of, I don't want to say, I, I guess irritation, not so much anger, but irritation and just general confusion. And, and this process has really uh, helped me to illuminate some of that for myself. No, it was always, it was definitely fun, as always, enjoyed it. Nice one. And what do you got coming up, sir? What, tell, lay it on people, what's going on in, uh, in your world? Same old, same old, just uh, spreading that Gnosis. I recently released uh, the Gnostic Tarot, which is doing very well. I didn't bring a deck because my wife keeps it for her stuff. So if people want to check that out, uh, Astronosis will be in August, working on that one here at the Theosophical Society. And then early next year, I have uh, my book, uh, America's Magician, my bio, spiritual bio on Elvis. Well, I, where I will make the case that Elvis is the greatest magician in Western culture. And I am ready to defend this to the till. And I look forward to chatting with you about it so we can throw those ideas around. It actually reminded me the other video that I've been meaning to do with you since 2022 is um, why the Hobbit movies are better than the book. And so I'll, I'll wait for your book to come out. And yeah. we'll um, we'll do our best to irritate and enrage the other in in uh, in, in dueling in dueling 
justifying videos. But I don't know, Gordon. Every time, every time this shit gets put out, the Hobbit trilogy looks better and better. Every time there's an acolyte okay. or rings of power, I start going, maybe it wasn't well, so bad. Well, after well, all. well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the archons destroying the art form that's making me realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, I've I've got some. Uh, oh yeah, I'm I also think starting working on. Uh, speaking of tricks, I'm also wor starting working on a David Bowie auto autobiography too. So. Oh, amazing! That's fun. Oh, wonderful. Well, is All something. Right. Do you know? Is have you noticed that biographers will always skip the spiritual lives of musicians, or they'll just mention it? It's like it doesn't matter. Like. Uh, Oh, yeah, David Bowie kind of, he studied uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and then he went and then they'll write 10 pages on him at the studio. I'm like, don't you realize that that experience would be huge for David Bowie? It garners more than a sentence or two. I don't know why biographers do that with everybody. I assume it's who gets selected to do it, like old music journalist or something. But, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, again, I've kept you for uh, for long enough, sir. But uh, thank you so much, and uh, and yeah, keep up the good work. Likewise, thank you. <laughs>